on World News Tonight. Agricultural aggression. Farmers in India fight stifling reforms in the form of mass protests. Financial fears. Afghanistan teeters on the edge of bankruptcy as systemic collapse looms. Vaccine victory. The strength of Pfizer jabs now proven in double dose adolescence. Blooming Christmas. Mexico bathing in hues of vermilion from the flowers of tradition. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off in India. Flushed with victory after Prime Minister Narendra Modi caved into demands for agricultural reform laws to be repealed, Indian farmers held a mass rally to demand minimum sport prices be extended to all products, not just rice and wheat. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. For more, Gayatri. Yes, Shenali. The protest movement launched by farmers more than a year ago became the most serious political challenge to the Hindu nationalist government and resulted in Modi making a surprise commitment to roll back the reforms. Thousands gathered for the latest rally in Lucknow, the capital of Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous state, where Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party will seek to hold on to power in state elections due to early next year. His climb down sparked celebrations by farmers but their leaders immediately warned that the protest would continue until the government promised to introduce a law that would guarantee minimum prices for all crops. Farmers also asked for the federal government to withdraw a draft electricity bill that they fear would lead to state governments withdrawing their right to free or subsidized power used mainly for irrigation. Growers have also asked the government to drop fines and other penalties for burning their fields after harvesting removed stock and chef. The smoke has become a major source of air pollution in Delhi and satellite towns bordering the crop growing northern states. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. The UN pushed for urgent action to prop up Afghanistan's banks, warning that a spike in people unable to repay loans, lower deposits and a cash liquidity crunch could cause the financial system to collapse within months. Afghanistan's economy has been plunged into chaos since the Taliban took over in August and most foreign aid was cut off. On Monday, the United Nations warned that the country's financial system could collapse within months. It says bank deposits are evaporating, new lending has dried up, and non-performing loans have almost doubled compared with the end of last year. Ordinary people are feeling the pain. The situation will get worse if world powers won't help, says this Kabul resident. But solutions are complicated by a host of international sanctions. That means the UN has to find a way to help the country's banks without helping the Taliban. Its proposals include deposit insurance and loan guarantees. Last month, the regime's acting information minister said its priority was to get access to assets now frozen by US sanctions. But Afghanistan's financial system faces another pressing problem. The supply of dollars threatens to run low. Afghan banks had relied heavily on shipments of notes, which have stopped. Experts say there's now a lack of cash in circulation, as local people stash away what little they have left. Sudan's military reinstated Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdak and announced the release of all political detainees, but protests continued with some pro-democracy groups accusing Hamdak of selling out the revolution. Sudan's military may have reinstated its civilian prime minister, but that didn't keep pro-democracy protesters from the streets. Nearly a month of unrest has seen dozens of people killed. On Sunday, military leader General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan signed an agreement to restore Abdullah Hamdok as the head of a transitional civilian government of technocrats and promised to release all political detainees. <laughs> But as the deal was announced, demonstrators in Khartoum chanted that Hamdok had sold the revolution. 
Pro-democracy groups have been demanding full civilian rule since the ouster of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir in 2019. Tens of thousands took part in scheduled protests in the capital and twin cities Omdurman and Bahri. Witnesses said security forces fired bullets and tear gas. But Hamdok's reinstatement has been welcomed by the likes of the United States, Britain, the European Union and the United Nations. Western powers had condemned the October 25th coup, in which Hamdok was placed under house arrest, and suspended support for the economically struggling country. Hamdok said on Sunday he had agreed to the deal to prevent more casualties. Burhan says the new agreement will be inclusive, though it made no mention of the forces of freedom and change. That is the civilian coalition that shared power with the military before the coup. The FFC said it did not recognize any agreement with the military. Former South Korean President Shung Do Hwan, whose iron fisted rule of the country following a 1979 military coup sparked a massive democracy protest, died at the age of 90. Former South Korean President Shung Do Hwan has died at the age of 90, his former press aide said on Tuesday. A former military commander, Chon, seized power in the coup of 1979 and then ruled the country with an iron fist. He presided over the 1980 Guangzhou Army massacre of pro-democracy demonstrators. He was later charged with mutiny, treason and was arrested after refusing to appear at the prosecutor's office and fleeing to his hometown. During his trial in the mid-1990s, he defended the coup as necessary to save the nation from a political crisis and denied sending troops into Guangzhou. In what was dubbed the trial of the century by local media, Chon was later found guilty of mutiny, treason and bribery and sentenced to death. In their verdict, judges said Chun's rise to power came through illegal means which inflicted enormous damage on the people. The ruling was, however, commuted by Seoul's High Court in recognition of Chun's role in the fast-paced economic development of the country and the peaceful transfer of the presidency in 1988. But his story didn't end there, and he made several returns to the spotlight. In 2003, he sparked outrage when he claimed he had assets of just around 245 US dollars in cash, two dogs and home appliances despite owing over 185 million US dollars in fines. Last year, he was also found guilty for defaming a late democracy activist and Catholic priest in his 2017 memoirs. Russia is under fire as NATO mulls spending military reinforcements to Ukraine in the latest development of diplomatic tensions between the two countries. Suspensions arose on a possible invasion by Russia into the country. According to Bloomberg, citing its military sources, the U.S. has shared intelligence, including maps with allies in Europe, that show a buildup of Russian troops and artillery to prepare for a rapid, large-scale push into Ukraine from multiple locations. The head of Ukraine's defense intelligence also told the Military Times on Saturday that Russia is planning an attack around the end of January or early February adding the invasion would likely involve airstrikes, artillery and armored attacks, followed by airborne and amphibious assaults, as well as smaller land incursions through neighboring Belarus. The Kremlin in response have gone on a verbal offensive while stressing the importance of a still unconfirmed U.S.-Russia summit, which Moscow says is in the works. It added that the West was artificially raising tensions by claiming Russia is planning an invasion. The latest reports come as tensions have been on a continuous rise after Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. Both the U.S. and its allies have been critical of the annexation, with President Joe Biden in February reiterating that the U.S. does not and will never recognize Russia's purported annexation of the peninsula. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News.
Welcome back and now on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. Europe is again becoming the epicenter of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Germany says the situation is worse now than ever before and Austria is imposing fresh lockdown measures. However, despite high case numbers there as well, the UK says Christmas will go ahead as usual with no extra restrictions. The latest surge is worse than anything Germany has experienced so far. This is what German Chancellor Angela Merkel said to her Conservative Party on Monday, calling for tougher restrictions to try and tame the spread. With hospital beds full and a vaccine rate remaining stubbornly below 70 percent, German Health Minister Jens Spahn gave a grave prediction on the same day that Germans will be, quote, vaccinated, cured or dead by the end of winter. Austria is now back in full national lockdown for the fourth time, becoming the first nation in Western Europe to reimpose such a severe lockdown since the vaccine rollout. That means for at least the next 10 days, people will be able to leave their homes for specific purposes, such as going to the doctors and to buy groceries. Austria is also the first EU country to announce a vaccine mandate for the entire country, which will come into effect on February 1st. In France, a violent protest erupted Guadeloupe over virus restrictions, leaving scars of burned vehicles and buildings. However, the UK is so confident over its COVID controls that it's ready for a normal Christmas. Britain's Education Minister Nadim Zahawi said Monday that people can host a big Christmas dinners and have their families around, underlining that there is no plan to tighten restrictions. The UK is banking on a booster vaccine program, making them available for people in their 40s from Monday. German Health Minister Jens Fahn warned that some 16 million Moderna doses could expire in the first quarter of next year if unused, adding that some experts see Moderna as the Rolls Royce of the vaccines. Swan was eager to promote the Moderna jab amid fears that stocks of the Pfizer-BioNTech product could run low. The Moderna shot is the luxury option among vaccines. At least that was according to German Health Minister Jens Spahn on Monday. Moderna. Moderna is a good, safe and very effective vaccine. Some doctors who carry out vaccinations say BioNTech is the Mercedes amongst vaccines and Moderna is the Rolls Royce. I believe this makes very clear that we have two very good mRNA vaccines available both for the first and the second shot, as well as the booster. Wie auch für die Spahn was eager to promote the Moderna jab amid fears that stocks of the Pfizer-BioNTech product could run low. That's as the country races to roll out booster shots to head off a possible fourth wave of the pandemic. Germany is also keen to use up stocks of the Moderna product that are due to expire early next year, some 16 million doses of it. Figures out Monday showed the country's infection count hit more than 30,000 over 24 hours, up 7,000 on a week ago. In response, Germany's 16 states are rolling out boosters, encouraging the unvaccinated to get shots and imposing a patchwork of restrictions. Among other measures, Christmas markets have been cancelled in Bavaria and the eastern state of Saxony. More than half of the United States are beginning to see COVID cases rise once more. Although this year, with the increased amount of vaccinated individuals, it is the unvaccinated who continue to drive up hospitalizations and deaths. Tonight, the warning signs are clear in pockets of the country. A crushing new wave of COVID cases is already eclipsing last winter's deadly surge. As the U.S. closes in on 100,000 new cases a day, more than half the nation is now recording a rise in new infections. We're far over capacity and really working hard to care for all these people. In parts of the Midwest, the Department of Defense is sending medical teams to relieve exhausted frontline workers. With inoculation numbers still climbing, 95 percent of federal workers, nearly 3.5 million employees, met today's vaccine mandate deadline. And stay nice and relaxed. But the majority of new shots into arms are boosters, not new vaccinations. Infections among the unvaccinated continue to drive this pandemic, hospitalizations and death. Even with COVID cases climbing 32 percent among children, it's not fear but holiday cheer most families are thinking of. Everyone's tested and everyone's like being as careful as possible. Compared to this time last year, massive lines for COVID testing are all but gone 
as we mark our first holiday season with vaccinations widely available. I'm like so happy I could cry. I really am. I'm like, it's been, the, it's like the end of a really long, like just crazy past two years. We have some good news for you. Pfizer has announced that its COVID-19 vaccine shows 100% efficacy in adolescents based on a late-stage clinical trial conducted among individuals aged 12 to 15. Two doses of the vaccine showed 100% efficacy even after four months. Pfizer's COVID-19 shot offers long-term protection for young teens, according to data from the company. Pfizer said Monday a late-stage study showed its two-dose vaccine was 100% effective in preventing infections in kids aged 12 to 15 from seven days through four months after the second dose. The vaccine it developed with BioNTech got the nod from U.S. regulators for emergency use for young teens back in May. The new long-term data will support the company's planned submissions for full regulatory approval for that age group. U.S. regulators have already granted Pfizer's shot full approval for use in people aged 16 and older. Shares of Pfizer rose in early trading Monday. They have now gained 39% this year. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea and Costa Rica have agreed to elevate their ties in an action-oriented comprehensive partnership. The decision was announced at a summit between President Moon Jae-in and his Costa Rican counterpart. The European benchmark price for carbon permits has surpassed 70 euros a tonne, a new record high. Monday was the sixth consecutive business day that European Union allowances hit an all-time high touching 71 euros and 21 cents a tonne. At least 45 people, including 12 children, died as a bus carrying mostly North Macedonian tourists crashed in flames on a highway in western Bulgaria hours before daybreak. Israel began rolling out Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccinations for 5 to 11-year-olds hoping to beat down a recent rise in coronavirus infections. Winds brought down the pollution levels in India capital New Delhi, marginally improving their air quality. However, respite was away from the toxic air of the Indian capital as the pollution levels still hovered in poor to very poor category in different parts of the city. Taiwanese Lugers hope to secure a place at the Winter Olympics, but they are facing difficulties in traveling abroad to practice on snow and ice due to travel restrictions. For six years, Taiwanese athlete Lee Sin Rong has sped down sloping roads and mountain highways on a duct-taped green sled with wheels instead of blades. She's luging, a sport where she has to ride a flat sled while on her back and she hopes to secure a place at the Winter Olympics, despite hailing from subtropical Taiwan. Winter athletes there often have to travel to training facilities abroad in order to practice on snow and ice. But global health restrictions have made those opportunities harder to come by. Beijing 2022 hopefuls, like the 23-year-old, have had to improvise if they want to make it past the qualifying round. For Li Wenyi, alpine skiing is a family affair. The 19-year-old's father was one of Taiwan's few professional skiers, but his dreams of competing in the Olympics were dashed by the island's mandatory military service. Now he runs a ski center, and with his daughter, training on the machines. While most athletes dream of gold at the Olympics, her focus is to start small. Gold medals have remained elusive for Taiwan, which only sent four athletes to the last Winter Games in 2018. Should these two women compete at the next one, they would be on the Chinese Taipei team at Beijing's insistence, which claims Taiwan as its own. Still, both have said they are proud to represent their homeland. The Winter Games kick off on February 4. And finally tonight, beautiful poinsettia or Nuchembuena flowers, an intense red flower endemic to Mexico, covered the country's capital city in celebrations of Christmas. Poinsettia is the plant native to Mexico and its production begins each year during February, especially in central states of the country. This year, local authorities expect the production will reach a million poinsettia plants. This enormous volume of plants will be commercialized amongst the inhabitants of Mexico City, but also the neighboring states. 
Hundreds of red flowers were seen in the streets of the city in the iconic Reforma Avenue where locals and tourists came every day to take photos near them. The flower's original name translates from the language of the Aztecs as wilting flower. It is used to decorate churches, squares and avenues around the country as well as throughout much of the world. In Mexico, it's known as Nochembuena because it reaches its magnificence during Christmas, thriving in a mixture of crisp and sunny weather. There are a number of varieties with genetic modifications ranging in size and color. In case you have missed any of the stories we add tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.